and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear, and we have returning guest Marshall Masters with us from YOWUSA.com. Now, there's a new book coming out that the powers that be aren't really happy about. It's called Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, a faith-based leadership guide. It's going to be available in August, so Marshall's going to give us the inside scoop. Thanks a lot for joining us, Marshall. How the heck are you? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, road hard, put up wet. Uh, it's good to be back, Rex. It's great to have you. Now, what's been going on? You were talking before the show about how you had some issues before this with this book. I mean, getting it released and stuff. So there might be a little bit of a delay. Well, they, you know, we have just been having uh, attacks left and right on my book. Being in it for the species, my Ingram distribution account was hacked into, and they delisted it for U.S. sales. And that went on for two months before I caught it. But this is the kind of stuff that they do. They always uh, try and impede you, uh, try and throttle the work from getting out there, preventing people from reading it, just simply because I, you know, I just tell it the way it is. Well, you tell it the way it is, and you obviously talk about stuff that many that have a lot of influence don't want you talking about, obviously. So... Now, this book that you put together that's coming out in August, Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, what is it about? I mean, obviously, the title, that makes sense, but talk to us more about it in depth, if you would. Well, what I've done with this book is come at this from a completely different standpoint for many years. I mean, well over a decade, I've been doing relocation consultations with people, and these Folks are typically going the me and mine approach where they're going to build a very deluxe uh, underground condominium with all the trimmings and a few years of supplies. And this me and mine approach to me is short-sighted because at some point they've got to come above ground. And when they do, they're going to be strangers in a strange land. And they're not going to know what the real dangers are or how to really, you know, defend themselves adequately because there will be predators on the surface that are going to look for these folks that are easy pickings. A good example is what happened in Argentina when the economy had collapsed. Upper middle class went up into the mountains and they bought small farms and figured that they would be safe up there. They could sit it out. They'd take their you know precious metals and jewels and go up there and hunker down. Well, what they didn't count on was that there were now unemployed military and police and they would go up there in their vehicles and in their uniforms and just go roll right in just to be expected and next thing these people knew it was hell on earth the women and children were being raped and brutalized frequently uh, what they would do with men uh, oftentimes was tie them to a bed and then take a blowtorch to them and force them to tell them where everything was at then if the family was lucky, they wouldn't be murdered. So there's a real history of, and you know, this is recent history where this me and mine approach is not going to work, not going to work out well in the long run. So my strategy is you need to be in a community of 100 plus people so that you're a hard target. There's enough people to man the parapets, if you will, in that case, but also enough people for a whole range of reasons and the ones that are going to do best are going to be faith-based organizations not the secular organizations I've been monitoring those over the years as well and what you see with the secular groups is that they're actually better capable in when it comes to bullets beans and bunkers they pull that together the problem with them is that they get leadership crisis issues that divide the community. Then once the community is fractured, they fall apart, and that's the end of it. So politics, uh, not a shortage of cash, is the worst problem that they have. Now, faith-based organizations have real specific advantages. The first and the biggest is that you got to walk humbly with God if you're going to get through this. Now, I first started, you know, and I have folks who write me and go, is this the same Marshall I knew 10 or 15 years ago? You know, and I, I say, you know, hey, the Marshall of 10 years ago was here and the Marshall of today. He'd be going, oh, ooh, you're one of them. But the work is transformative and you do bond a relationship with creator. And that changes the whole dynamic and how you come at it, because now you're surviving in service to others and for a noble purpose when you do that.
So faith-based organizations have that advantage. Another advantage is while everything is political, okay, <laughs> churches included, but they do have an accepted hierarchy. They're going to be far less susceptible to leadership crisis issues that are going to divide the communities. Uh, the next thing that I find is a real strong suit for them is that on one hand it can take, you know, 30 years to get a school and a library built for a church. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a disaster in three days, you can stand up a formidable response and you're out there doing really powerful things to help people. And so faith-based organizations have this as something that they do well. Then finally, the one thing I think is in some respects more important than some of the others is diversity of skills. You know, you go to church on Sunday or whatever your faith is and you're praying. Well, the person next to you is works in one field, another one in another field, you know, doctors, you could have plumbers, carpenters, electricians, all kinds of people are coming together. Their purpose is not to be there to get a paycheck. Their, their purpose is there to celebrate their relationship with Creator. And so you have this diversity of skill sets, and then these people are going to know people who are in hobby groups that are related to it. So, for example, uh, you may have someone that you know, is uh, a gun enthusiast and goes out trap shooting. You know? and so now that person knows people who are out there and shooting trap. Um, or you have someone that has ham radio and then they've joined ham radio clubs and they're doing things. In other words, they have access to human resources that are considerable. And so all of these things can come together. Now, the question is, when does it come together? And the book is written for two audiences. The first audience is going to be the faith-based leaders. It's a plan. It's a leadership guide. It is not a how-to. There are numerous, many wonderful how-tos out there, Rex, and I don't compete with them. As a matter of fact, in my book, I mention several of them by name and the authors so that people can go out and get those books and put them in their survival library. My focus is on leadership. How do you organize your community and get it moving in the right direction? And here is where the leadership guide, there's nothing like it out there. Everything tends to be focused on you know, the, the material acquisition side, the how-to side. These things are important, but what's not out there is a leadership guide that says to somebody, all right, you're looking up in the sky and you are seeing a clear and present danger. Now, I don't care what they're saying on television, will, which will likely be, oh, don't worry, it's just going to be an interesting light show. You, you know, uh, take it to the bank. They are going to do that. They're just going to say it's a light show. They're going to say but, it's concentrated swamp gas, essentially. Yeah, concentrated swamp gas. <laughs> and uh, that's good. I like that. So, uh, But you'd be surprised. Uh, the vast majority of people are going to be happy with that explanation because it's what they want to hear. They know they're being lied to, but they would rather be lied to than to actually be responsible for recognizing a clear and present danger. Now, people who are in leadership areas are more risk sensitive. You know, they have to take risks, they're risk adverse, they're uh, risk management, risk evaluation. Risk is more of something you understand and work with every day if you're in a leadership role. So <clears throat> what the book really does is it's written to help these people who are going I don't really know that much about it, but I know what I see with my own two lying eyes. And I see a clear and present danger, and I know I need to get my flock to safety. And then the second audience is for people who are in awareness. And over the years, particularly in the last few years, I've worked with so many people that are in awareness, and they're frustrated. They're saying, what is the point of being in awareness if I don't have the money to build a bunker. Well, the message of the book to them is that's not your mission. Building bunkers is not what God wants you to do. Y your awareness is for a very specific mission, and that is to be a teacher, a mentor, and a comforter. 
And so what you do is you have two copies of the book. One you read for yourself, and you know it like the back of your hand, and then the right moment will come and you will walk up to the leader of a faith-based organization and they're going to have that where do I begin look on their face and that's when you hand them a copy of the book and you just say this is what you need this is what you want it has the plan for right now this moment this time if you have any questions I am happily and always at your service and that is where you begin in the mentoring and the comforting role, because that leader is going to be coming into awareness on very short order. And so that's the reason why I've written this book in a very different way from any other book I've ever written. All my other books tend to be more, you know, third, third person, active voice, technical documentation style. This is conversational. What I actually do is I engage the reader, and the reader becomes my counterpart in the book. And what we do is... Instead of sitting here and just going, oh, man, you ought to look at this. You ought to look at that. You ought to look at this. Next thing you know, the poor schmo is wanting to take a long walk off a short pier. That's not going to help him. Instead, what I do is I have a, an analogy. I use a time machine to take the reader to a very beautiful and tranquil place. And there, I share the knowledge as though I'm just sitting down with that person one-on-one -on -one and having a conversation. And so the book is enjoyable to read. And it's something where I wanted it to impart the necessary knowledge, things that leaders need to know. Where are you going to cite your communities? What is the optimal structure that you want to build for what is coming? Where do you want to build that optimal structure and how? What technology is going to be the best? And I'm talking in terms of not only what is affordable, but what can be rapidly deployed. You know, if you're going to say, here, do this, it'll take you six months to build it. I'm sorry, that's not going to work. I'm talking about things that'll take a matter of weeks, not months. And because it has to be a rapid deployment community. But then I get into other things. I talk a great deal about wellness, communications. Uh, and I also have a chapter devoted to incident command system for anyone out there that is... Uh, aware of ICS because they're a firefighter or police, they understand how ICS works and that it is a really wonderful way for reacting to incidents when things happen. And so this is an example of what I put in there. Uh, another distinction I draw between myself and others is, yes, the elites are going to have evil minions placed in roles of leadership within the government. But things are going to deteriorate at a federal level, which means it's all politics are local, as the old saying goes. Control is going to revert to more local. And when this happens, you're going to have local governments, and they're not going to be so interested in kowtowing and catering to these well-placed evil minions. And they're not going to feel as much of a need to do that because these evil minions can do it by virtue of the fact that they have the force of the banking system behind them. You know, anyone who does not comply loses their paycheck. They lose their savings. They lose their retirement. They lose, 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 lose. So you either do the dirty deeds we tell you to do, or, you know, you're going to wind up living in a trailer and working in the exciting world of fast food. And, that's how they do it. But right. once the banking system collapses, Rex, they're not going to hold sway like they did before. Now, it's not going to be immediate. It will shift over in time. So this is something where what I'm saying to people is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, when you have a survival community, you want to bond a relationship locally through volunteer programs like CERT and ARIES, where these are volunteers who are willing to go out there for the community in times of a disaster and do disaster activities. Uh, ARIES is the Amateur Radio Emergency Services. Uh, CERT is Community Emergency Response Teams. And these programs are national. Um, CERT is more to the west than to the east. 
But these are examples of things. You could also get involved with Red Cross. See, what I say in the book is that the tribulations, you're going to have the opportunity to choose one of three roles for yourself. You are going to be a victim, you are going to be a troublemaker, or you're going to be a part of the solution. What I'm telling people is you want to be a part of the solution. And what I'm saying to folks who are in awareness, if you cannot afford a mountain of beans, become, become worth your weight in beans. You come in with valuable skills that are going to be quickly recognized and appreciated. And you know, what you want to do is you're, you're looking for the right kind of opportunities. Um, there's an expression, when the, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And we tend to think of that from the student side of the coin, where all of a sudden, boom, the right teacher for the right moment materializes out of thin air, like Star Trek, like a trans transporter. And that's really not how it works. If you look at the flip side of the coin, and you see it from the teacher's standpoint. And, you know, what colleges do is they send recruiters out to go find students that are going to be really good, that are going to excel, bring honors upon the university, and really achieve, do important things in their lives. They're looking for the cream of the crop. So these recruiters are going to go to areas where they are going to have the largest pools of good candidates to work on. And then they're going to select within that pool various groups that they feel are most likely to produce what they're looking for. Then they observe. And then one day they see kids step out of the ranks and shines. You know, like that little angel on top of the Christmas tree. And what do they do? What do they do? Hello, here you are. Shake hands. Here's a brochure. They materialize out of nowhere. For the kid, it's like, where did you come from? Okay, well, that's what you have to do as a teacher. So you're looking for where your best candidates are. You're going in that direction because you are, you're not sitting there like most people do and they're praying to God, save my tuchus. Save my tuchus. You know? <laughs> I haven't heard that term in a while. <laughs> yeah, and that's what they're doing. They're begging and they're begging and they're begging and they're begging. Well, what if you do it differently and you say, hey, God, I'm in this with you. What can I do to be in service? And that changes the whole dynamic. And so that's what I'm emphasizing for people in awareness, that they take on that role. And they're going into communities where communities are going to have you know, three simple rules. Everyone works, everyone defends, everyone participates. And it is going to be an all for one and a one for all. Uh, this is something where people who are difficult to deal with are not going to be very well tolerated. Um, you know, folks don't really think about it this much. We have a go along to get along kind of a society. But you talk about people who are ego driven, boy, they're dangerous. Well, who ego driven people are so dangerous. By the way, they're the ones that are easy to spot. They're the ones that are saying, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I just know I got to be the boss. That's ego driven. And these people are true amateurs. There's novices and there's amateurs. Novices take responsibility for their mistakes. Amateurs believe they have a God-given right to make mistakes at someone else's expense. Amateurs are really, you know, they can create a lot of grief for you, especially if they're the ego-driven kind. Because while not all sociopaths are ego-driven, or not all ego-driven people, excuse me, are sociopaths, all sociopaths are ego-driven. So folks that do that, habitual liars are not going to be well tolerated. Uh, people that are violent. Um, in a lot of communities, they find out you know, that you have people that are uh, abusing women and children. That's not going to be well tolerated because in a tribulation, women and children are going to be the real precious resources of a community. Without healthy young women wanting to have healthy families, you're not going to have continuity of progeny 
you're not going to have a steady progression of people in every age bracket moving through the age cycle. And if you have a community that winds up with nothing but a bunch of 10-year-olds and 50-year-olds, well, you're going to have about as much success as Social Security is looking at right now. And so these are the things that I'm really doing with this book. Is It's a very frank way of talking to a faith-based leader and saying, hey, you know what? For thousands of years, people have been talking about Revelation. They believe it. Absolutely. No question about it. And they've always believed it wouldn't happen on their watch. Well, Bunky, this time you're the one who showed up late to the party and you've been stuck with the check. It's happening on your watch. There's a lot right. going on. Absolutely a lot going on. And uh, we just put up our latest signs article, Signs 11. And my wife Jennifer does those and she does a brilliant job of them because what we are seeing with the media is uh, the mainstream media, in particular electronic media, there is an outright suppression campaign. There are a lot of things that are happening, Rex, and they intentionally omit, trivialize, or demean these things. Uh, you know, and they'll tend to localize them, and they have, you know, bizarre things. One of the things that are happening now that is worldwide, uh, houses are exploding. And people are reporting the sound of an impact or a detonation when this happens. We have been talking for a long time about this steady increase in meteors. Uh, and this month has a 49% increase over this time last year. Think about that. 49%. And houses are blowing up. There are things happening around the world. We're seeing many more instances of uh, positive lightning. Ground, you know, it, and this is, it's easy to spot when you see it on YouTube. It's pink colored. They had just had videos in this. Uh, Jennifer put stuff up from Cuba. And these people had never seen it before. And they had tornadoes offshore with pink lightning multiple tornadoes running simultaneously and it was really remarkable because these people were mesmerized gee isn't this fascinating you know because they don't see this regularly they don't see it and one of them was like an f3 it came ashore and people died um, in germany she found a video and she had me watch it <clears throat> and this couple of in Germany is driving down the road. You know, Germany is famous for white wine. It's not famous for uh, white wine and beer, but it's not famous for tornadoes. It is now. Right. Okay. And this husband and wife are driving, and the wife is going, let's get away from this thing. It's coming towards us. And the husband is, oh, it's okay. And then finally, it's getting close enough, and they're seeing things fly around inside it. And the husband, ah, maybe it's time to turn around and get the heck out of here. So that's something that is new that we're seeing. People are, they're seeing new and deadly phenomena. And they see it and they just can't believe what they're seeing. But then it hits and it's bad. And I mean, the flooding that's going on in China right now, it is mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. And we're having a tremendous amount of flooding going on here in the United States as well. But China is its just staggering. And, you know, you start going around the world. You look at the number of volcanoes that are erupting, everything that's happening. I've been writing about earth changes and Planet X for quite some time. I started with earth changes back in 1999. And 2002 was my first Planet X article. I've been at this continuously. And in the last year, it's, it stuns me. It literally stuns me. Uh, there are things happening every day that would take weeks, if not months, for these things to happen in previous years. And so we're definitely in the thick of it. And um, this is, we're, we're coming up on this window of opportunity. That's really what it is. We have one last window of opportunity and I'll tell you what that is 
<clears throat> you know, in the Colburn Bible, it warns us that the Planet X system does exactly what it's doing right now. It kind of dances around behind the sun. And then when it comes out from behind the sun, all hell breaks loose. And it's going to come out. We're already starting to see, I mean, just on a daily basis, Rex, there's just tremendous amount of YouTube video out there. And, yeah, you know, there's the flaky stuff, but... The good stuff is ever, ever, ever so much more. And particularly with the reporting of an object, you know, it's about uh, at the three o'clock position relative to the sun, where you see the sun and the object next to it, both of them are casting a reflection on water. And then the object is passing behind clouds and coming out from behind the clouds. I'm sorry, you know, uh, reflections don't do that. And you know, anyone that tells you oh, it's a sun dog, well, they don't know what a sun dog is. They really don't know what a sun dog is. But we are starting to see what's called chem dogs, and that is a reality. Uh, the chemtrail spring is immensely intense right now, more than ever before. And, you know, you look up in the sky and you see where they'll have several tracks of chemtrails going. So everything is really coming to this point where... We hit a tipping, we hit a tipping point. And then all of a sudden, everything just starts coming unglued once we hit that tipping point. Then when that happens, you know, we're going to have, it'll be a violence that's coming. We're already seeing a tremendous amount of violence. And this could bring about, and most likely will, bring about martial law. Martial law is going to precede the arrival of Planet X, and it's going to be for any reason other than Planet X. But what folks have to understand about plan when we go into martial law is it's going to ratchet tighter and ratchet tighter and ratchet tighter like a choker chain on a dog. And <clears throat> there will come a point where the borders will be sealed. Commerce will get through. Trains will get through. Trucks will get through. But if you want to relocate, No. You're going to have to survive in place. And if you are waiting to the last minute to decide what you're going to do, that is what the last minute's going to look like. No options. So when Planet X system comes out from behind the sun, everyone's looking at it. And while we're still hearing them say on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox, Oh, nothing to worry about, folks. Just an interesting light show. It's, you know, don't get all upset and, you know, don't believe the people that are trying to sell you comet pills. When you hear that nonsense, that is the last window of opportunity. Yeah. And yeah. that's what my book is written for, that last window of opportunity. And <clears throat> what I show people how to do is to set up a rapid deployment community of 100 or more and walk humbly with God, follow a noble purpose. Not to be something that's about the end of this civilization. You survive to become a clean slate for the beginning of the next. So what kind of people would fit in perfectly with a 100-person community? You know, name off the top five or so positions that you feel would be imperative in order to make that community thrive. Well, you're going to have people coming from a wide variety of fields and backgrounds and walks of life. But <clears throat> most important of all, it needs to be people who share a common love for God. They may come from different particular religious faiths, but it's important that all of them share a common love for God. It's important that all of them understand that this is not about holding on to things. It's about holding on to each other, which means one for all and all for one. And these are going to be people who are going to be all in. They're going to be fully committed. You know, you're going to have plenty of folks that are going to dabble. Well, let's pretend to be interested. Let's see what we can get out of this for very little effort on our part. Let's be clever, play both ends against the middle. These people will become obvious very quickly. And there's not going to be much tolerance for them. You're going to have what I call Lot's Wife Syndrome. That's going to be rampant. Um, 
You're just going to have people that are going to say, I, I can't do a relocation. I can't go somewhere else. I can't start over again. I'm next to my mother or I'm next to my grandchildren or I'm next to these people or I'm next to this or I have work here and I can't leave these things and go somewhere else to survive a tribulation. And what will happen is these Lot's, Lot's wife syndrome people are going to go into think and feel mode where their thinking is what they feel. Consequently, they're going to think they are eminently rational and logical about what they're doing. But that's not the case. They're going to be completely emotional. And they're not going to want to let go. So, you know, it's who are the people who are going to do it? The ones who are stout-hearted. The ones who are courageous. The meek. If you look at the 12th century definition of the term in an etymology dictionary, not what we have today, which is an ungodly perversion of a very nice word, but you look at it, what it meant in the 12th century when the word meek was coined. So these are the people that are going to be the ones that you get through it with. And you're not going to know until it gets right down to the nut cutting. Uh, and saying, well, you know, people... Uh, they don't have you know, any viable skills. No, I wouldn't say that. A grandmother that knows how to grow herbs in her garden is going to be very valuable. Um, you may have a lawyer who also is, uh, you know, enjoys target shooting and loads his own ammunition. And that makes him a valuable person, not so much that he's a lawyer, but that he's got a viable survival skill. So the survival skills are not going to be things that you're going to see in a jobs classified listing, typically. It's going to be the variety of things that people bring to the table. And here's where folks are going to have a lot of skills, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge of things that they've done and they've tried and they've experimented with in their lives. Never gave much thought about it. But then those things will come back. And they will know, you know, maybe somebody who remembers as a child more helping her mother make pemmican. Well, pemmican's going to be phenomenal survival food. So <clears throat> it's a wide variety of things. But bottom line is the right kind of people are the ones that just understand. It's one for all, all for one. Everyone works, everyone defends, everyone participates. Where do you think the best place to start the first survival community would be if, if you were to have your choice and pick one location do you have something in mind in general i like uh, northern united states uh not in the plains up near the canadian border and at least you know as a rule you want to be 150 miles away from a major body of water at an altitude of 2500 feet so there's a lot of areas, you know, for example, uh, north of Asheville in North Carolina, uh, there's nice areas up there. I've been over, you know, in other regions of the country. I've done an awful lot of what we call reconnaissance work on the ground. And uh, so you're going to have areas that are going to logically be good to go. I mean, here are the things that you want to look for. One, you don't want to be near nuclear or fracking. If, you're, if you've got a nuclear power plant in the area, you want to be at least 50 miles upwind and 100 miles downwind, minimum. Uh, if you have fracking in the area, you want to be as far away from it as possible. Best is no fracking at all because fracking wells are going to fail and poison a lot of habitable land that would be suitable for survival. That's really going to be a disaster for us. That takes out a lot of Texas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I feel sorry for Pennsylvania. Tom Ridge done the dirty on them up there. Boy, I'll tell you. Um, you know, now, in terms of terrain, you're looking for rolling hills, soft soil, and lots of access to good, clean, sweet water. And if you do those things, you follow those basic guidelines, uh, you know, you're going to Find some place that's good. You know, it's also important that you don't want to be close to a major metropolitan area. Okay, and the reason why is you're going to have a big city near you. The refugees are going to pour out of there like locusts. 
And if you think they're going to have a brotherly love and meaningful conversation about the liberal values of sharing food, don't hold your breath. <laughs> okay. You think it's going to be like the road? Oh, aspects of it, yeah. Yeah, aspects of it will be. But even the road is not really, there are parts of the road that were com not really, uh, they just don't fit with what is actually going to happen. And a lot of the times where, you know, the little boy is, you know, oblivious to what's happening around him. Now, by that time, everyone's going to know. Everyone's going to be pretty cagey. And when you're down into the needs hierarchy, you're not going to be having meaningful conversations. You are going to be in reptilian survival mode. So it's really going to change. But on the other hand, it does give you an idea. You know, now think about it. What do you see in the road and the book of Eli? The book of Eli was came out about the same time. It was much more popular. It was a lot more fun to watch, actually. And uh, But cannibalism was a real problem. Right. All right. And that was part of it. That will happen. That will happen. Uh, you're going to have people that I call the biters, and they're going to be infected with rabies, and rabies makes you want to bite. All right? And uh, it's how the disease spreads. So you're going to have problems with biters. You're going to have problems with gangs, warlords. These things are going to be a problem for the, up till the pole shift. And... Uh, it is during the pole shift that really the, the problem folk are going to be decimated. Few, if any, are going to be left. Because it's really going to take uh, a strong sense of self to make it through the pole shift in the days of darkness. And it's going to take a strong, loving relationship with God. Now, I'm not talking about sitting down there with your hymnals singing to the top of your voice. That's not going to save you. It's what's in your heart that's going to save you. You know, you can sit there and sing to God all you want, but if you got hate in your heart, you got hate, you know, you, you hate somebody, you hate Jews, you hate blacks, you hate this, you hate that, you have hate for any reason in your heart, that hate's going to be amplified a hundredfold. And you'll just flicker out like a light bulb. So who's going to survive? It's the ones that got love in their heart. What does that look like? Well, Imagine a, a grandmother who pulls together a group of orphan children who are scared. Says, children, let's sit down together and hold hands and we're going to sing nursery rhymes. And while the whole world's going to ape around them, they're singing, Old MacDonald had a farm. And that is putting them in a state of love. They will survive. They will survive. So, you know, it's not what people think that you know, the survival of the fittest during the pole shift that's going to be such a horrific event. Yeah, there will be some of those that survive because they'll be drugging, you know, they'll be in, our, <laughs> in a coma, artificial coma, or, you know, they're just going to be heavily doped up so much they just can't, you know, fathom what's happening around them in the first place. But, you know, for the ones that don't have that luxury of being tended that way and making it during the pole shift, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be taken. It is going to be, of all of the events, and there are going to be many events that take a lot of lives, but it's the pole shift that's going to be the worst. How long do you think that's <laughs> going to take? It'll take matters of days. From, you know, from beginning to end. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, in... I explained, actually, uh, the orbital mechanics of the Planet X system in very precise detail in this book. Uh, how it travels through space, where it comes from, where it's going back to, uh, what part of space where it's traveling that it becomes a real difficult uh, and clear and present danger for us, and how that's going to play out in the many different ways. And I map that out. The book has, to give you an idea, the book is over 400 pages with over 140 color illustrations. There's nothing left to doubt. Now, also, if somebody picks up a pre-edition, you're offering a couple extra features as well, aren't you? Yes, this is the pre-sell edition and or the advanced purchase. Uh, this one will be where it is a numbered edition, personalized and signed. And 
for those who are purchasing it, you know, it'll take longer to ship these, obviously. We will be shipping after the street date. And, uh, but those who do purchase now will get a 25% discount on one copy and 35% off on two copies. And we have both uh, hard case laminate and uh, paperback editions that we're bringing out. Right now our book is, we're in the pre-press mode where everything's done. It's just the physical mechanical work of, you know, just formatting the book for printing. Awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. And if you go to YOWUSA, you'll also have access to a lot of different articles and podcasts and information. I'm sure most people have heard of your website that are listening to this podcast, but many people that haven't, now you know. Uh, maybe a couple more things we could talk about as well, Marshall, before we close out tonight. Sure. So let's say somebody had you know, three or $4,000 to put together a shelter of some kind. Would it be a good idea to go out and purchase one of those, let's say 40 foot containers and have somebody come out with a backhoe and, and build, you know, get a huge hole in the ground and then drop it in there and set up something or what would be the best thing to do with just a few thousand bucks? Well, the best thing, you're not going to put a container in the ground for a few thousand dollars. Uh, you got to have an excavator or you're going to use backfill. The container itself will cost you a couple of thousand. Then you have to work on making the container habitable. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people like to use, uh, you know, the corrugated steel pipe you know, like for culverts and things like that. Uh, in the book, I'm actually talking about using domes. And there's ways that it, you can actually build a dome in the ancient style uh, that will withstand a lot of abuse. It will last. And uh, I described that in the book as well. There's three different construction methods that I talk about. Uh, but to give you an idea of domes, uh, you know, people think it's something kind of a new style. But really, when you go back and look at history, uh, ancient Rome, all right? And you have uh, the Eskimos. Their igloos are domes. Now, they're subject to weather, so, but still the same. They're extremely, extremely strong. And so there's been domes, use of domes throughout history, and they're the strongest structure. And in the book, I actually show you how to do that. So if you're going to do it for a few thousand dollars and you're going to do that, then buy rebar, buy concrete and get out there with your friends. You could do it. And then you'd need some type of maybe windmills and solar panels. What do you think about solar? Well, it's the sky is going to be a mess. All right, for a few years. But even under those circumstances, solar is going to operate. Energy is going to be a catch as catch can. Now, one of the things I recommend is that you have to be subterranean, you have to be underground. There you have an advantage that you have a constant temperature. Uh, but in terms of energy and power, you know, we've been led to believe that, you know, the only way you can get it is through fossil fuels. Well, that myth is dying. You know, over in India, it's cheaper for them to produce electricity with solar than it is f with coal. Uh, you have nations that are going 100% towards renewable energy sources. And I think one thing that we're going to see, you know, I, I see a black cloud coming, as do other people. But I see a silver lining as well. And an example of that silver lining is, we're not going to have all these special interests with their paid government goons going out there and suppressing inventive minds. People are going to be inventing zero-point energy devices. They're going to be finding new and brilliant ways to produce energy and to store energy. Absent all of this vested interest control mechanism, which is brutal and huge, when that goes away, what do we have left? We have a nation full of Teslas. Think about that. That'd be amazing. That'd be you know the new renaissance of source. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the reason why we can look at like we can look at this either as the end of a civilization or as a clean slate for the beginning of the next. I'm a clean slate guy because what I want to see at the back end of this is a Star Trek future. That's it. Everything I do, everything I hope for, I want humanity to have that Star Trek future. Whether I see it or not, my 
walking with God is about that. Wouldn't that be fun to just be able to jump in some really fast spaceship and then go travel to stars? I mean, wow, it'd be incredible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, do you, let me ask you this. I mean, do you think that there are some type of, or is a sp- secret space program out there similar to that, that has that type of tech? I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, what we're seeing is, you know, think about it. <clears throat> Astronomy, for a long time, all of the big money was to answer the Big Bang question. And then they finally figured out, well, okay, there's this dark matter and dark energy and it's perpetually pushing us out. So we're not going to collapse back into a singularity. And they spent an awful lot of money on that. Funny thing is in the Colburn Bible in the first few pages explains the whole thing that they spent billions of dollars to figure out. And the Egyptians knew this 3,600 years ago. Go figure. But, you know, I see us having the potential just to do a lot of amazing things. And, yeah, there's secret programs and all of this, but we're going to go through an evolutionary event. I think that's the most important thing to understand because what are the people who survived the pole shift? What are they going to go through? And what do they come from? You know, earlier we were talking about the grandmother sitting around with the orphans singing, Old MacDonald had a farm, right? They're in a state of love. Right. Well, they're going to have profound near-death experiences, shared-death experiences, and out-of-body experiences where they will see themselves as eternal beings. And there's just vast libraries of documentation on this by physicians. When people have these experiences... What makes them profound, that they're ranked as a profound experience, is that they see themselves as an eternal being. And in that instant, they lose all fear of death. And when they come back, if they were materialistic to begin with, they come back and their their life is more spiritual. Rather than being in service to self, they want to be in service to others. They want to do something meaningful. They want to do something noble. So I believe that the vast number of people who are going to survive this are going to have these profound experiences. And the people who stand up to rebuild the world, and that will happen. We will have blue skies. Again, we will taste sweet waters again. That will happen. Humanity will survive. That will happen. We will rebuild. That will happen, and we will go to space. That will happen. The question for all the other races in the galaxy is, how do we go to space? Do we have a Star Trek future where we respect life? Or are we going to show up like a bunch of Anunnaki stormtroopers to take and bleed and kill whatever and however we want? Or you could be the Borg, and that would be the worst of the. Th- that would be the absolute worst, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. You will not assimilate me. <laughs> Resistance is futile. We will add your distinctiveness to our own. Boy, <laughs> you know, is that like I'll respect you in the morning? <laughs> Man, you know, some people listen to that song by um, John Lennon, "Imagine," where he talks about everybody is all the same essentially and some people are like oh that sounds so happy and so loving and i think of the borg man when i hear that song i'm like no <laughs> no i don't want to imagine that yeah i like being unique absolutely well marcel this is this has been fantastic i really appreciate you coming on the show with us it's always great to hear from you and i certainly hope we'll speak again soon i can't wait to get my copy of surviving the planet x tribulation a faith-based leadership guide and i'm going to get an autographed copy so i can have that in my library all right i look forward to that well thank you marshall this is great and folks go to yowusa.com you'll have access not only to that book that's coming out in august but also the um the bible that he was referring to the colburn bible and many other featured podcasts as well so have a fantastic day everybody if you go to leakproject.com and become a contributing member you'll have access to exclusive content also youtube.com slash clandestine time lord you'll have access to all the latest podcasts for free have a wonderful day everybody and be the change you want to see this is rex bear Talk to you soon.
Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear, and we have returning guest Marshall Masters with us from YOWUSA.com. Now, there's a new book coming out that the powers that be aren't really happy about. It's called Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, a faith based leadership guide. It's going to be available in August. So, Marshall's going to give us the inside scoop. Thanks a lot for joining us, Marshall. How the heck are you? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, road hard, put up wet. Uh, it's good to be back, Rex. It's great to have you. Now, what's been going on? You were talking before the show about how you had some issues before this with this book. I mean, getting it released and stuff. So there might be a little bit of a delay. Well, they, you know, we have just been having uh, attacks left and right on my book being in it for the species. My Ingram distribution account was hacked into, and they delisted it for U.S. sales. And that went on for two months before I caught it. But this is the kind of stuff that they do. They always uh, try and impede you, uh, try and throttle the work from getting out there, preventing people from reading it, just simply because I, you know, I just tell it the way it is. Well, you tell it the way it is, and you obviously talk about stuff that many that have a lot of influence don't want you talking about, obviously. So... Now, this book that you put together that's coming out in August, Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, what is it about? I mean, obviously, the title, that makes sense, but talk to us more about it in depth, if you would. Well, what I've done with this book is come at this from a completely different standpoint for many years. I mean, well over a decade, I've been doing relocation consultations with people, and these folks are typically going the me and mine approach where they're going to build a very deluxe uh, underground condominium with all the trimmings and a few years of supplies. And this me and mine approach to me is short-sighted because at some point they've got to come above ground. And when they do, they're going to be strangers in a strange land. And they're not going to know what the real dangers are or how to really, you know, defend themselves adequately because there will be predators on the surface that are going to look for these folks that are easy pickings. A good example is what happened in Argentina when the economy had collapsed. Upper middle class went up into the mountains and they bought small farms and figured that they would be safe up there. They could sit it out. They'd take their you know precious metals and jewels and go up there and hunker down. Well, what they didn't count on was that there were now unemployed military and police, and they would go up there in their vehicles and in their uniforms and just go roll right in, just to be expected. And next thing these people knew, it was hell on earth. The women and children were being raped and brutalized frequently. Uh, what they would do with men uh, oftentimes was tie them to a bed and then take a blowtorch to them and force them to tell them where everything was at. Then if the family was lucky, they wouldn't be murdered. So there's a real history of, and, you know, this is recent history where this me and mine approach is not going to work, not going to work out well in the long run. So my strategy is you need to be in a community of 100 plus people so that you're a hard target. There's enough people to man the parapets, if you will, in that case but also enough people for a whole range of reasons. And the ones that are going to do best are going to be faith-based organizations, not the secular organizations. I've been monitoring those over the years as well. And what you see with the secular groups is that they're actually better capable in when it comes to bullets, beans, and bunkers. They pull that together. The problem with them is that they get leadership crisis issues that divide the community. Then once the communities fracture, they fall apart, and that's the end of it. So politics, uh, not a shortage of cash, is the worst problem that they have. Now, faith-based organizations have real specific advantages. The first and the biggest is that you got to walk humbly with God if you're going to get through this. Now, I first started, you know, and I have folks who write me and go, is this the same marshal I knew 10 or 15 years ago? You know, and I, I say, you know, hey, the marshal of 10 years ago was here and the marshal of today, he'd be going, oh, you're one of them. 
but the work is transformative and you do bond a relationship with creator and that changes the whole dynamic and how you come at it because now you're surviving in service to others and for a noble purpose when you do that so faith-based organizations have that advantage another advantage is while everything is political okay <laughs> churches included but they do have an accepted hierarchy. They're going to be far less susceptible to leadership crisis issues that are going to divide the communities. Uh, the next thing that I find is a real strong suit for them is that on one hand it can take you know 30 years to get a school and a library built for a church. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a disaster in three days, you can stand up a formidable response and you're out there doing really powerful things to help people. And so faith-based organizations have this as something that they do well. Then finally, the one thing I think is in some respects more important than some of the others is diversity of skills. You know, you go to church on Sunday or whatever your faith is and you're praying. Well, the person next to you is works in one field, another one in another field, you know, doctors, you could have plumbers, carpenters, electricians, all kinds of people are coming together. Their purpose is not to be there to get a paycheck, their, their purpose is there to celebrate their relationship with Creator. And so you have this diversity of skill sets, and then these people are going to know people who are in hobby groups that are related to it. So, for example, uh, you may have someone that you know, is uh, a gun enthusiast and goes out trap shooting. You know? So now that person knows people who are out there and shooting trap. Um, or you have someone that has ham radio and then they've joined ham radio clubs and they're doing things. In other words, they have access to human resources that are considerable. And so all of these things can come together. Now, the question is, when does it come together? And the book is written for two audiences. The first audience is going to be the faith-based leaders. It's a plan. It's a leadership guide. It is not a how-to. There are numerous, many wonderful how-tos out there, 